Hello, and welcome back to The Road to 2000s. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I'll be your driver on this, on this road. Um, today's topic is a little bit more fun, a little bit more uh, light than a lot of the Road to 2000s have been. Usually it's like heavy stuff, like this is how to calculate, and you should train like this, or, or something like that. Today, I wanted to go over swindles. And of course, this is a lot, uh, a lot of fun. It's one of my favorite parts of chess is losing all game and you know feeling badly, and then all of a sudden you find that tactical shot or that trick that gets you back into the game. So I wanted to start off with a couple uh, swindles that happened just from some online games I've played within actually the past week. Uh, this kind of happens all the time online, and it's where you'll find most of your swindles uh, working the best. And then I wanted to go so, to some actual over-the-board games I had played and see how it can actually impact at a little bit of a higher level. And then we're going to take a look, finally, at the highest level of chess, some games between uh, the world's best players, and see how uh, even they can, can still get swindled and how it can happen in your games as well. So this first game I, I want to go through pretty quickly. It was just a blitz game online. I had the white pieces here. And I found myself in this end game. So I found a little tactic here to take the e5 pawn. Black takes my d6 pawn. And after knight d3, black chose to play bishop c4. And I went in for this kind of tactic that uh, gets us into this singular knight end game. So what do you think's going on here? Who would you rather be? White or black? White's got a really good d pawn. Yeah, we've got a super far advanced pawn if we're the white pieces. But is this a benefit or a, or a bad thing? Can black take advantage of it and make it a weakness? So yeah, it can be a huge benefit. It kind of ties up the black pieces. In this case, though, it's a little bit far from our pieces. So if we're not careful, black is simply going to play king f8, king e8, and king d7 and capture our pawn. Uh, he can also add in this knight as another attacker after he brings the king in. And this pawn might just fall. So as white, I was actually a little bit nervous here. And I think black should be doing pretty well in this endgame. So the idea I came up with was to simply place this knight onto f5 and to try to hold this pawn and attack some of, uh, some of black's weaknesses as well. He simply, he simply played knight to g8, which is kind of an odd looking move to defend the h pawn. And this is kind of where he started going wrong, I think. I just brought my king into the game. King d4, king e6. And this is where uh, I kind of had to make a decision. So in your games, if you think you're a little bit worse off, uh, this works best at, obviously, fast time controls. Uh, you need something to you know, generate some swindles, to generate some tricks, to generate some ideas. You need some kind of advantage. In a lot of the games that we look at, the advantage is going to be that the opponent's king is weak. Obviously, that can't really work here. Uh, it's tough to have a weak king when there's just a knight on the board. But in this case, I have a different type of advantage. My advantage is this really far advanced pawn. And while black is attacking it, if I give up this advantage, then there's really nothing for me to play for. right? If I give up my d6 pawn, I mean, how, how am I ever going to win the game? Uh, black is going to be advancing these pawns pretty quickly. And he has a pawn majority on the queen's side. And this knight is really close to, to really making some threats on my king's side. So I decided, how am I going to win the game if I don't have this d6 pawn? So I came up with a pretty uh, fancy way to try to keep it. Do you guys see any ideas on how to hold this pawn? So obviously, the problem is our knight's attacked. And if we move the knight, the pawn falls immediately. Yeah. So we need something a bit better. Because the knight's being attacked too. King can go to c. So yeah, you're, you're along the right direction here. Uh, we want to bring our king in this way. Uh, but we can't give up the knight just yet, because this idea doesn't work, because the black knight is here to defend. However, if the black knight were to be drawn to some other square, and then this idea would be working, and our knight would be untouchable. So is there any way we can combine those ideas? G4? Yeah, g4 is exactly right. We solidify our knight for a moment. Black captures this pawn. We capture back. And after knight takes g4, kind of accepting our sacrifice, I played king c5. 
So I'm risking a lot here, but you always kind of have to do uh, when swindling opportunities arise. So of course, black can't capture this, because the pawn will promote. My opponent is a good enough player to realize this, but he simply just captures my last pawn. And so now I've got some, some trouble to worry about, right? I've got problem number one and problem number two. And uh, I had better find something to make up for it. So I've got my one advantage over here. And I decide to go all in and try to take this, this other pawn on b7. The black king retreats, which is pretty natural. He just wants to blockade the pawn. I go ahead and capture. He starts bringing back his knight uh, to defend against my pawn. And he does so successfully. And actually, black is probably just winning here. But of course, it's a blitz game. Uh, the players are low on time. So I shuffle back and forth. And since my opponent thinks he's winning, uh, he tries to win, which trying to win is a great way to lose a chess game. And trying to lose can sometimes be a way to win. Uh, so he gives up the c6 pawn, trying to advance his, ki his queen or kingside pawns, which this should still be fine for black. But at this point, white probably has enough for a draw, because the king had left c6, and I can kind of kick this knight around for eternity, and he can't ever really leave without letting me queen. He came up with f4. I played knight h5, f3, king b7, f2, knight back to g3. I had to stop the queen. We dance around with the knights for a couple moves. I finally play king c7, doing things a little bit differently. And after this, the knight really is having a tough time uh, getting back to stop this pawn. He comes up with king d7, sacrificing the knight. Maybe a bit better was this move. But at this point, he was very low on time. So what do you think the idea is here? So yeah, if we push, what was black's idea? Knight c8. Yeah, knight c8. So usually the knight is enough to kind of stop, stop this pawn some way, somehow. But of course, my opponent's low on time. He just brings the king back. And eventually, we get here. And what do you think's going on here? Should white win, or should black draw somehow? Stalemate by promoting on c1. Mm -hmm. Knight takes c1 and then. So f1, yeah. G, or I'm sorry, f1 and then g3. Right. So this is this is one idea. Is black can try to do this? Though, well, if white doesn't take it, then it yeah, a queen might be coming. But you're on the right track. So one thing's for certain: this black king isn't going anywhere unless we let it out. So does anybody see any potential checkmates for white? It's where it starts getting fun. I'll give you a hint here. White is actually completely winning. So you can imagine the knight landing here. Imagine that. Right? How do you get there? So you can imagine it. If you can find some way for this knight to get here, some path. How do you get there? Huh. It's really tough, right? It's, it takes a lot of moves. E2, D4. Mm -hmm. So the problem is, as soon as you step here, yeah, yeah, it's over. It's over. Let's see. Imagine some knight to f1, to e3, to d5, to c7, right? Yeah. So all in all, what if we do it right away? Then black can probably just play g3. And this looks like a problem. If we take queens, and then it's enough for a draw, Hello. like you were saying. So it turns out the win here is to simply waste a tempo, force black to queen. It's the only move. And you ignore this pawn. And believe it or not, this is checkmate. <laughs> so just to, just to put the cherry on top, um, and prove it's a real swindle. I didn't see any of this. Um, I knew that knight c7 was checkmate. And I was like, OK, I'm going to get my knight to c7. I don't care if I lose this game. It, it's worth trying. And so I didn't see this clever idea of wasting a tempo. So I simply played knight f1 immediately. He played g3. 
I played knight e3, and now my opponent had a chance to draw by queening immediately. However, he didn't really sense the danger, and he wanted to try to win. So he wanted to play g2, which is, of course, losing to the same trick. So I did end up winning in the end, not quite as it was intended. But so yeah, so that was just like a, a fun swindle that happened, uh, happened just within this last week. Um, and so what was the point of all this, of looking at this? Well, for one, it's, it's a lot of fun. And number two is it really introduces this idea, if you want to win a game uh, where you think you're behind, and you think you're like a better player than your opponent, you really think, you OK, I have to win this game, um, you have to leave yourself with something. You have to have some, something to play for, at least one thing. In this case, it was first my d-pawn, and then my a-pawn. If you don't have this one thing you can really play for to pressure your opponent, you're not going to find any like fancy swindles or anything like that. Your opponent might blunder something if you get really, really lucky. And luck definitely plays a huge part in any swindle. But uh, it's very, very unlikely that you'll find something. Um, I'm going to jump right to uh, another one of my swindles. <laughs> um, so this one was played against Jonathan Schrantz, who, as you may remember, I played a huge match with uh, a couple months ago. And this was the one that uh, kind of turned the tide of the match. It, get, it put me in the lead, and I, I won the next game uh, pretty quickly. So here, I had the white pieces. I played b4, completely missing that knight b3 forks my queen and my rook. And so uh, now I'm just totally lost, but that's OK. You have to be losing in order to pull off a swindle. So the first step is lose the game before you can win it. So black is totally winning here. He's up the exchange. He's got a lot of pressure on the second rank. He's got pressure in my d-pawn. His queen is going to find a path in after I have to deal with this pawn. Things are bad. But OK, you just have to keep playing moves in this situation. So I move my bishop to b2, trying to relieve some of this pressure. I come up with a, a one-move tactic, which thankfully pays off. I take, make advan I take advantage of this pin. But that's OK. Black's still completely winning. And uh, then you know, I, I, the reason I uh, played like this wasn't so much that I could win a pawn, because the pawn wasn't very important. Like my pawn is hanging. The queen can just come in to checkmate me. But I saw that I had a trick here. I saw that my opponent's king had been left a little bit weak. And if he thought my idea was just to win a pawn, then I could kind of execute this trick. So in the game, black played queen c2. Who can find the swindle? Does anybody see it? It's a two mover. Bishop e d five. Mhm. Mm and then what's the point? Check. So yeah, it's check. What what will Black do? And, uh, king will move. King has to move. H one. Mhm. Then we can cut that uh, rook. Yeah, and that's just checkmate. Bishop d d5, king h8, yeah. checkmate. You can also try rook f7. And I could take this, but there's also actually just checkmate in one. And so I won this game like this. Um, so once again, when things are bad, uh, if you see an idea, a tactical idea, you have something to play for, you should try it. Because I mean, the worst that happens is they see it, and then you're still losing, which you were losing in the first place. Um, so this was also a blitz game, though. So you might be saying, well, OK, I mean, this works in fast time control chess, but I mean, come on, let's see some real, real life examples. So now I wanted to go over this game, which was a classical time control that I played against Jonathan Israel, who is a chess instructor here at the club. I think he's uh, around the eight, 1800 level. And so this one wasn't so much a direct swindle where I was totally dead lost and I found some one move trick to come back into the game, but it was more of a kind of a dirty game. You know what I mean? Uh, it's like, OK, I, I want to checkmate this guy. I, I want to get out of here. I want to win the staff, staff uh, championship. So let's see how it went. He played the old Benoni, which is signified after this move kind of e5. So d6, c5, and e5. This structure is, is the idea. I played bishop e2, bishop e3, uh, a6, a4. I want to stop this b5 idea. And here, I decided to go for h3. So what do you think the point of h3 is? Mm. 
There are a few points. So this is the big point, is it controls g4. It stops a bishop from coming here. Almost more importantly, it can stop a knight from coming here. So if he were to play like rook b8 and I play knight f3, now there's no knight g4 attacking my bishop because my pawn controls it. I also had more devious intentions, though. After knight f8, which is what was played, I played g4. So um, this is a good way to set yourself up for uh, kind of an easy attack. Um, when the center is closed like this, very often, both players will keep their, their kings in the center. Or, you know, they'll castle a little queen side. But the point is, it's not an entirely important to castle that king with the center so closed. So I just wanted to kind of attack my opponent uh, in kind of a crude way and, and see what I could make of it. So my idea is I just want to push these pawns up the board and gain a lot of space on the king side where my bishops point, and then hopefully generate an attack on the king from there. He played very calmly. He played h6. I continued with h4, my plan. He played knight h7, uh, putting a lot of attackers on g5 and attacking this h4 pawn. So if you're the player with the white pieces here, uh, what do you want to do? I'll give you a couple options. You can play h5, defending your pawn from this threat. You can play g5, sacrificing this pawn after something like takes and takes. Or you can ignore it. You can play something like knight f3. What do you think? You like knight f3? OK. Knight f3 is a bit of a red herring. There's a problem with it. Uh, it loses this pawn. Oh. If I could play knight f3, that'd be great. But uh, leaves g4 behind. The big two options are h5 or g5. Which one do you think I should go for? g5. g5. So why is that? So we can play pawn takes and pawn takes. And the really good benefit to this is it opens up our rook. The bad news is that it is a pawn sacrifice. Black can just win a pawn. So if h5 doesn't really give up anything, why don't we want to play it? What's the problem with h5? h5, we are just a bowing. So we're blocking off you know, some of our ideas, but it gives up a very important square. It gives up g5. So this bishop is kind of not so great for black. But now, he can simply bring it to g5. Um, I'll be forced to kind of allow this trade. And his knights can kind of untangle themselves, right? This pawn's going to be a bit weak. I have some f4 ideas still, but I, I don't really trust them. So h5 is bad because it gives up this g5 square. And it keeps everything closed. So I went for g5, giving up a pawn and going for some swindles. Uh, queen d2, he plays rook g8. So he wanted to step out of this pen, which makes a lot of sense. I play knight f3. You need all your pieces in the attack. Knight f6, knight g5, knight g6, king d2, uh, knight g4. I have to take this. He takes this. And simply rook g1. Uh, the bishop comes back to d7, and let's pause for a moment here. So which side would you rather be, white or black? I think white looks a little better. White looks a little better? Yeah. It's got the open h file, semi-open g file. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely white is a little bit more active right now, especially with the rooks in this knight. But what does black have going for him? Black has some significant advantages as well. So the first one is obvious. Black's up a pawn, right? This pawn doesn't mean a lot right now. But down the road, uh, you know, this pawn is, is going to mean a lot. But a lot more important than that is his pieces have some squares. This bishop's eyeing this a pawn. And he's probably going to play b5 soon, opening up this rook. Where can this knight go? This knight has a very nice square. 
Yeah, this f4 square looks very, very nice for this knight. If this knight lands on f4, it's going to be blocking off my queen for my knight. And it's going to be kind of really in my way. Um, one more advantage for white is this king is a little bit loose. But all in all, I think black actually stands better here. Uh, largely thanks to this you know, hero knight that can jump into f4, and also thanks to the extra pawn. But as white, uh, as the higher rated player in this event, um, you really don't want to just like give up on your attack because of that. Uh, you always want to be playing for counterplay, playing for threats, and really bringing all of your pieces into the attack. And more often than not, if you do something like this, just continue playing naturally, continue playing uh, threatening looking moves, uh, your, your opponents are either going to believe your threats and give up a lot, or they're going to miss something. And uh, that's what happened in this game. So simply rook h7, bringing the rook in. Uh, queen f6, I brought my knight to e2. So you got to use all the pieces in the attack. Bishop a4, so uh, black kind of takes another pawn, which maybe isn't what black should be doing right now. You know, you kind of got to sort out your king before you go grabbing even more. I play knight g3, and then uh, black plays a very natural move, and he also plays a losing move. So what would you play with black here? What moves come to mind? Keep in mind, I'm threatening to do stuff like this, and hit this guy, stuff like this, and hit both of these guys. Some dangerous things. Go to f4 to try to trade queens. So yeah, that's a natural idea. You want to trade off the queens. Any other ideas? What do you think? What would you play? Any ideas? That's okay. Yeah, so b5, I wouldn't be so ready to do. It's a nice idea. Uh, it does kind of block off this bishop. So tactically, it's, it's not great. And also, I might want to put my king over there, because it's starting to look pretty dangerous on this side of the board. So that's kind of my bailout, is I want to castle queen side and have at least this pawn for protection. So yeah, I thought, OK, you might try to castle queen side or something. Um, he might play queen f4. The move I was really worried about was knight f4. So once again, um, black should seek counterplay here. Rather than passively defending, that's how you kind of start to get into territory where it, it gets very dangerous for you and, and you start getting swindled. Uh, you you want to kind of defend actively. You want to make your own threats and uh, pose white some problems. So I would love to play knight f5 here, but I think tactically there's just this move knight d5. And if I were to take. Now my knight is undefended. So now d4 would have given me a lot of problems, and I think black would be winning in this position. Instead, he went for the natural queen f4, thinking if he could just trade queens, all his problems would be solved. But uh, this is not so, not so true, because I've got four other pieces left. And uh, his pieces are quite scattered kind of across the board. So you know, I just had to activate my pieces. I played knight f5. He played rook d8, trying to defend this pawn. This gives up on g7. And pretty quickly after this, uh, more pawns fell. Uh, some tactics came. And this is simply over for black. And he resigned in this position. So it's up to you if you want to classify this as a swindle. But uh, it just really shows the importance of peace activity and finding, uh, making threats, finding something to play against. Right? Uh, as long as you have some kind of plan, something to play against, if your opponent doesn't find a plan, more often than not, you're going to win. It doesn't matter if your plan is the wrong plan, if your plan's kind of dumb and shouldn't work. If you're at least playing towards one idea and your opponent isn't, more often than not, your one idea is going to be the decider. And that's kind of what happened here. I came up with a horrible <coughs> plan of pushing my king side pawns and making threats on that side of the board. And this plan shouldn't work, and this plan is pretty bad for white, but in the end, my opponent didn't come up with a plan. He started playing moves on the king's side. He traded off these knights. Then he eyed his pieces at the queen's side and played bishop takes a4. And then he said, let's just trade the queens and kind of consolidate. 
And his kind of jumping across the board like this is what led to him uh, just kind of losing. So even in swindles, you have to be playing for a plan, playing for an idea. Um, OK, that's enough of my stupid games, though. Why don't we take a look at uh, Swindler Extraordinaire, Hikaru Nakamura, and unlikely Swindler, Magnus Carlsen. It's not very often that you see Magnus Carlsen uh, in a worse position. But uh, it happened here. And uh, Magnus really, uh, really, really hooked Nakamura, really swindled him <laughs> in, in this game. So I don't know if you guys remember or are familiar with this, but for a long time, Nakamura had an awful score against Magnus. Nakamura was like the number two player in the world, number three player in the world, uh, very solidly the number one player in the US. But he had lost something like seven games against Carlsen. They had a number of draws, but Hikaru had never won a game. Um, and this, was, this game was back in 2014. And this was during that era when Hikaru just couldn't seem to get it done against Magnus. And so uh, whether it be uh, psychological problems that Nakamura was dealing with, with this you know, unbeatable guy that he just can't, can't checkmate, uh, as well as just uh, Magnus being a very slippery kind of guy, very difficult guy to, uh, to beat, uh, it led to Nakamura's downfall in this game. So the game started off in an opening I've covered here before in an F3 Nimzo. Magnus played d5. And we got a very interesting line where white gets a huge center. And black gets to play for some dark squares. And that's really all black's going to be playing for is the dark squares. Magnus brought the bishop back to c5. Bishop came to g7, or g5 rather. Uh, both players kind of get developed. Uh, Hikario opts to castle queenside. And bishop d4. These moves are kind of OK for Magnus, but already he's in some trouble. Uh, white's simply going to attack on the king side. Black decides he should try to attack on the queen side. But in reality, after a couple, whoops, running out of power. Um, I'll get you in a second. Ben is on the hunt for a power cord pretty soon. But uh, OK, what was I saying? Black's already in some trouble here. He made a couple inaccurate moves. This a5 and rook a6 idea to activate this rook wasn't really the most accurate. And uh, white is already uh, kind of just winning. And winning pretty easily. White simply plays knight g3, uh, bringing his knight into the attack. We see g6, trying to uh, keep this knight out of some key squares. White continues with h4, and black plays a4. Rook h2 is a very nice move to defend uh, laterally. Uh, the queen comes out to a5. We see the bishop drop back to d2, get, getting out of the way of the g-pawn. And after h5, rook b6, bishop c1, you can really see how uh, white's attack just seems to be coming through a lot faster. Uh, black does capture on b2, a momentary piece sacrifice. But in this position, you can kind of see, uh, see what happens. So for the moment, uh, white is up a piece. Black's going to regain this piece on b2. But uh, it's not going to be enough to kind of stop White's attack. So this is, so far was a brilliantly played game by Nakamura. He's totally winning in this position. If I flip on the engine, it says, yeah, plus 5, plus 6, plus 12, whatever you want. N Nakamura is the best. The game's over. But uh, that's, that's not how it happens, <laughs> as you can see. So it started off uh, with rook takes b2. This move makes sense. Um, Nakamura found the accurate king a1, just stepping out of it. Of course, it'd be a huge mistake to capture this rook, as you would get checkmated in one move. So there's still some tricks here, but Nakamura steps out of them. Um, rook takes h2, rook takes h2, queen g6, uh, knight f5, rook e8, queen g4, queen b6, queen h3, queen g6. They're kind of shuffling a little bit. Here I've got the power cord coming in with the save. All right. Uh, and then here is Nakamura's kind of critical mistake. So how should you approach positions like this? Uh, black really can't do anything, right? Uh, this rook can't move. If this rook steps out of the way, let's just say white passes. If this rook steps out of the way, uh, black gets hit with this 97 check, which is killer. If this queen steps out of the way, 
um, takes on g5, for example, you get checkmated in one move. So these two pieces can't move. Uh, that's, that's first off. Secondly, OK, maybe this knight can move, but what do you do with it, right? I mean, you come to b6. This doesn't do anything. Uh, you come to a5. This doesn't do anything. You threaten one check, but of course it's not going to help you. You can push this pawn, but again, it's really not going to help your situation here. So Nakamura has all the time in the world. And what he did was rush things. So of course, when your opponent can't move, there's absolutely no need to rush. Right? You just want to make sure everything is locked down, you keep your opponent out of the game, and you avoid all counterplay. However, the move he did allows black away uh, back into the game. Um, already, uh, white is still better, but uh, after this next move, it's going to be a lot trickier to, to win the game. So what do you think Magnus came up with? What's his one thing that he should be playing for? You know, in that first uh, game that I showed, my one thing was I had a pawn on d6 and then a pawn on the a file that I wanted to promote. Um, in that game against Jonathan, I saw one tactic, one trick that I could play for, and I played for it. So what's Magnus's one thing going to be? He's got three pawns against one on that yeah. king side, queen side board. He's got a lot of pawns. Um, so maybe in some end game, uh, he can try to push these. That's something to play for. But more important than that, white has a problem. So all these pieces are great. This piece is awesome. This piece is awesome. This piece is awesome. This piece is not awesome. Um, White's attack has broken through, and White's attack was much faster in this game. But Black's attack did some damage as well. He got rid of two of these key defenders, two of these pawns, in front of the White King, and uh, left a lot of open space back there. So Magnus's one thing that he wants to play for is he wants to make some threats against White's King. So how on earth are you going to achieve that from this position? So step one is finding some way for these two pieces to uh, start playing. So how did Magnus open up a file to get these two pieces in the game? What could he have done? First of all, white's making a lot of threats here. For one, he's just going to play knight e7 next turn if you don't stop him. Black and uh, knight can go d6. Uh, exactly, knight takes d6. Now, this is actually a peace sacrifice. Yeah. If you notice, after knight takes d6, queen takes d6 is not very good due to checkmate, which we've seen this before. We, we said, you know, this queen can't move, this rook can't move. But now that the knight has been drawn to d6, the black rook actually can move, because there's no knight e7 threat. So this lets black play. Um, let's see, my arrow key stopped working. This lets black play rook d8. And all of a sudden, we see a pathway, a pathway to this king. right? So white has to be careful. White plays knight c4, but all of a sudden, queen takes e4. And we've got a lot of pathways into this king, right? a lot of threats to look out for, a lot of open lines. And not a lot of pieces uh, defending the white king. And so already, uh, black is equalized here. And if white isn't very, very careful, uh, he's just going to get checkmated, which is similar to what happened in the game. Uh, white went with uh, queen h5, trying to keep an eye on this diagonal. Black simply plays rook d3. After rook h4, queen f5, keeping an eye on this. Queen comes back to e2, so all of a sudden we see the, black pe the white pieces coming back, 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 and the black pieces going forward, forward, forward. And I uh, can kind of tell you the, the tide of the game, which way this game is turning. The black king is getting safer, the white king is getting less safe. So now b5, so Magnus brings these pawns into action. Knight d2, this allows queen takes g5 in this endgame. And in this endgame, black is simply 
uh, dominating. He's got one, two, three, four, five pawns in exchange for one knight. And really, you need about three pawns for it to be considered equal. And so very quickly, this game actually just ended in disaster. Um, this H pawn simply comes down the board, and then this E pawn comes down the board, and then uh, here, uh, Hikaru actually just resigned. So from plus a billion crushing position to uh, resigning, uh, just completely lost endgame fairly quickly. Um, so this, this was a pretty famous game, uh, a pretty famous swindle. And uh, it really, uh, it took Hikaru another, I think, like two or three years before he managed to score a win against Magnus. <laughs> so he would have loved to get this one back. And so, as always, getting these uh, miraculous ways back into the game, it's all about playing for one thing, whether it be uh, a weakness in the opponent's camp, a weak king, or just even a simple tactical idea that you see and you think your opponent might miss. Uh, you need something to play for. Uh, now I think I'm going to look at what might be the most famous swindle of all time. Um, I think they called it something like the swindle of the century uh, on some website that I found it on. So this game was between Alexander Beliovsky and Larry Mark Christensen. Larry Christensen, of course, uh, one of the US chess greats, uh, world-class player uh, back in his day. And he uh, played quite, quite a lot of good games. Uh, this wasn't one of them. But this, however, was one of the greatest swindles. Actually, Larry will be playing the upcoming US seniors. Yeah, so get, keep an eye out for Larry. Starting July 10th, he'll be here uh, in St. Louis playing the US Senior Championship. Um, so get to see him back in action. This game was uh, eventually, I believe, a King's Indian defense after some maneuvering. So uh, who's familiar with this, this opening? Have you guys seen something like this before? No? OK, well, quickly uh, I'll explain some ideas. Uh, White has a huge center. And he wants to use this center to expand on the queen side. He wants to use the C pawn as his mobile kind of pawn lever. And he wants to win on the queen side. And meanwhile, Black's idea is usually to either break down the center somehow, uh, sometimes by putting a knight on c5 and playing f5, or more commonly, he wants to checkmate white, using f5, f4, g5, g4, and really just throwing everything at white to try and win. And so let's see this battle of ideas and how it plays out in this game. We see knight d7, uh, bringing this knight to c5 perhaps, but now simply b4. So in this specific variation that we got, um, white seems to be in time to kind of stop black's ideas before he gets there. So a5 is natural, trying to break down white's defense of this square. Um, so once again, I'll ask you uh, two options. Should you play something like b5 or something like a3? Which one looks more natural? One of these is a huge positional mistake. Game ending mistake. A3 or B5. Neither of them look game ending, but they kind of can be. A3. You want to play A3? Sure. Yeah, so A3 is totally right. What's wrong with B5? Does anybody know? Has to do with this battle of ideas that I just talked about. So, in general, in chess, uh, the side where you have more space, you want to maneuver your pieces over there and then kind of rip it open. Because once you open it up, uh, your opponent's pieces aren't going to be well placed because he had less space to move around in. So you can kind of picture white's rooks easily coming here, um, white's bishop maybe dropping back, looking at some squares, the white queen looking at some more squares. This knight is already well placed for the queen side. Whereas black's pieces, this queen's a little shut out by his own knight, or her own knight. These rooks can come over, but they're just staring at their own pawns. This knight is nowhere near the queen side. So white wants to open things up on the queen side eventually. That's what I'm trying to say. And with b5, he's locking it down permanently. Black will play a very natural move, like b6. Uh, white can continue pretty much any way he likes. Uh, we'll just make some, some move. And now after knight c5, uh, white really has a stronghold on the c5 square. 
you can attack white's center, and white can't really do anything about it. So b5 is like a horrible positional move. You never really want to close the position on the side where you have more space. So a3 was played. This keeps uh, the threat of the pawn on c5, so the knight can't jump there. And eventually, white's plan to open it up is going to be to push this pawn forward. So we see rook a6, another kind of instance where rook a6 isn't the greatest move. Uh, it's meant by knight b5, hitting black's weakness. Knight b6, defending it with the queen. We see rook c1, again preparing this idea of c5. Takes, takes. Queen d7, queen d3. Rook a4, queen b3, rook a8. White is just preparing himself for this idea of opening it up with c5. And we see black making some moves on the king's side, but you can kind of tell uh, he's nowhere near achieving his plan. He's not going to find some checkmate with just a queen over here. White has kind of succeeded already by making black play on the side of the board where black has less space. So queen e7, black's kind of just maneuvering around. c6, and now uh, finally white breaks through with c5. So we see once again uh, kind of the black pieces. OK, maybe these rooks are active on the A file. Uh, but this knight is a little out in the middle of nowhere on g4. And this knight on b6 isn't very happy either. Meanwhile, uh, white's knight wants to jump into d6. Both of white's rooks are well placed. And the bishop makes threats both on this knight and on the queen side. So already, I think white is just completely crushing here. Uh, white won the battle of ideas. He got to play on the side where he had more space, generate threats on that side, while black couldn't really do anything about it. We saw pawn takes and pawn takes. Of course, the tactical idea is if you take this guy, I'll take this guy. And I'll likely win this. And even if I don't, this pawn's going to be very, very strong, especially with these rooks coming down. So we saw knight d7 instead. This knight does come to the d6 square. Knight back to f6. And bishop c4. And knight takes f2. So this is where the swindles kind of start. Um, so I'm sure Larry Christensen was sitting back looking at this position, uh, entirely unhappy, and said, OK, I need something to play for. So what is black's thing that he can play for here? Um, there's no real weaknesses in the white camp. You can may maybe say e4 is weak, but it's pretty easily defended, both by this knight and you know, even if necessary, a rook or a queen can get back to defend it. Maybe c5 is going to be weak, but it's also pretty well defended by the rook already. And this knight stops this queen from interacting with it. So what's black going to play for? Does anybody have any ideas? What can black play for? Right now, it looks like nothing. So I already showed the next move accidentally. I went a bit too far. He played knight takes f2. So of course, what does this tell you black wants to play for? A draw? Not a draw, specifically. What's his weakness? What's white's weakness that he wants to play against? He's got more pawns on that side of the board than white. Yes, yeah, so he has more pawns. But knight takes f2 is a very, very direct move. It's saying, what, what does black want to do? You don't give up a piece for a pawn to say, OK, now I have more pawns. It's an imbalance, but not a favorable one. Huh. White king takes the knight. The white king. Mm -hmm. Then the rook can check the king. OK. The queen can take the rook. So you're talking in specifics. Yeah. Generally, what is black playing against after knight takes f2? It's similar to what Magnus did against Hikaru. He gave up his knight in order to, to do what? In order to get where? To this king, right? So black created something to play against. In this position, the white king is very well defended. g3 is defended by this pawn. This file is closed because the pawn is there. You can easily defend it with either rook. But after knight takes f2, this king is looking a little bit airy, a little loose. There's ideas of rook a3 hitting this pawn indirectly through the queen. 
So ideas of knight g4 and queen f6 coming towards this king. And uh, to, you know, Larry probably thought, OK, maybe I can do something with all of these ideas. Unfortunately for him, he's totally dead lost here. This is totally dead. He just gave up a knight for a pawn, which is horrible. It's awful. Uh, white should never lose this game. Uh, and if, in fact, you know, after rook a3, white simply captures on f7 with check. The king has to move, and white plays queen e6. So now, Alexander Belyovsky, I'm, I'm, you know, of course, uh, I have no idea what actually happened, but I like to imagine. Uh, in my editorialization that uh, Belyovsky sat back like, OK, come on, Larry, resign. <laughs> come on, you're down a piece. My king might be weak, but your king is much weaker than my king will ever be. I've got two rooks on the back rank. I'm offering a queen trade. If we trade the queens, like you're, just, you're down a piece. You're down a full piece. You don't even have a pawn for it. So he's probably sitting there indignant and insulted. And Larry's like, OK, I'll give you a check. Uh, the king runs away. It's like, OK, I'll bring in my other rook, try to get something going. And now probably uh, Belyovsky should have started sensing some danger. So first of all, what happens if white takes this free queen? Yeah, all of a sudden, we see a draw. So Larry's not without ideas here. Rook a3 was a very, very clever move to delay having to deal with this queen. So this is a draw, and it's actually a draw by perpetual check. And the reason for that is the king can never step up. So it's confined to moving side to side, and our rook has access to all of these squares. So this would be a draw. But OK, I mean, Belyovsky is like, come on, dude. I'm one of the world's best grandmasters. I'm not going to play queen takes queen. Who do you think I am? This is an obvious trick. Uh, he <laughs> plays 98 check and says, ha ha, what are you going to do now? King h6 is played. Uh, running away. <laughs> uh, once again, you can imagine queen takes queen. It's the same idea. However, knight takes knight is a little bit better. It's saying, OK, I have the h3 square under control. If you go for this same idea, I simply play king h1. There's no more checks. If you take my queen, I still control this square. It's two pieces now, Larry. How many pieces is it going to take before you give it up? So OK, I mean, Larry just plays rook takes g3, king h1. We see this idea on the board. Plays queen takes f7. So this idea is uh, the same idea we, we've just seen, right? So what happens after queen takes queen? It's the same idea, same perpetual draw. Larry's uh, got one idea, and he's sticking with it. So queen takes queen. Once again, Belyovsky is like, oh, come on, dude, rook d7. This is checkmate. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Let's go home. I'm done playing chess. Um, Larry played queen takes knight. And you know, Belyovsky, I'm sure, was just like, OK, finally, he's giving it up. Just queen takes queen. The game's over. And then he was shocked. He was appalled at black's next move. What do you think happened? Find the draw. We try the same idea. It doesn't quite work, right? King can come here. We can take. Rook B8 check. Um, this one? No, I was, take, I was trying to get to a stalemate. Yeah. He's got the well, you're on the right track. You're on the right track. Well, you don't have time to put, put a rook here. It's checkmate. No matter which rook you eat, it's checkmate. You need something immediate. All right, Ben Simon thinks he has the answer. I got this great combo. How about rook g1? Rook g1. I'll take it. And now I just want to harass him forever with the other rook until he takes it. Mm. So he's saying now if rook g2, daring you to take, this is stalemate. The g pawn was mentioned, but the g pawn is pinned to the king. Yeah. However, if you do things like this, 
What if I run away? If you check me here, you got to be careful, because you can take like this, and then the G-pawn can move. If you check me here, once again, <laughs> I'm going to start running. And maybe you can check me for a while. But someday, some glorious day, I will find the comfort. Hold on. I'm not doing a very good job here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is looking better and better. Hmm. What on earth? Ah, oh, man, this, this is more tricky than I gave it credit for. So there's a simpler way to, to arrive at the same kind of thing. But this is, this is pretty tricky here. All right, I refuse to believe that this is also a draw. I'll look at that in a second. But uh, OK, what's the easier way? So you've noticed now uh, that giving up both these rooks in this position would be stalemate. So there's a much easier way where the white king can't escape. The white king has nowhere to go. So this move was tried. What else is there? While you think about that, I'll try to find a way to win. <laughs> rook h2. Yeah, rook h2 is, is the easier way. So now, of course, the white king is confined to the h file. And eventually, you will be forced to capture. And so after rook h2, uh, the game was agreed to be drawn. Um, and I can only imagine how furious <laughs> Alexander Belyovsky was after this one. But let's take another look at this, because this is interesting. So rook g2 check, king f1. Rook g1 check is the only move. Mm -mm. And how do I escape? How do I escape? Maybe I don't escape. Oh, that'd be crazy if this was also a draw. Hmm. I don't know. Do you guys have any idea? Rookie one. I don't know what can be done. Maybe this is also drawn. Let's take a look. No, it's definitely not drawn. I was right the first time. You run, you run, you keep running. Oh, of course, c takes b6, allowing the c pawn to move. Very well done. So you have to go here, and then I can step this way. I can step this way. And finally, I can take you. Once my rook disappears, uh, the threat is no longer there. So that would have been a very nice win for white. But unfortunately, rook h2 exists. And this game was a draw. So swindle of the century, they said. Uh, in incredible game. Um, so it just goes to show, never get too confident in yourself, even if you're a world-class grandmaster. Um, all right, I think we have time to look at one more swindle. Um, I felt bad about what I did at Karu Nakamura earlier, uh, showing, showing his you know, most painful loss of his career against Magnus Carlsen. So uh, here, here's one for him. Here's one for him. So Hikaru had the black pieces here. Um, so what do you think is going on in this end game? Who would you rather be, white or black? Victor or Hikaru? So step one, my step one at least, in evaluating positions, is I like to count the number of pieces. So both players have a rook. Both players have a bishop. White has this knight for this rook. So white's actually down the exchange. But he's got this pawn, and he's got this pawn. So all in all, I'd rather be white here. The big reason for that is if black does nothing, this is going to happen. Uh, and there's no way to stop it. The bishop controls a7, the knight controls these two squares, and uh, black would be in a lot of trouble. So king b2 was played in this case. Rook, a, rook uh, h h1, knight to b8. And pretty quickly, this pawn is captured. And so now white is definitely just uh, much better. In fact, white is winning here. 
Um, not only does he have this A pawn ready to go, but he also has this B pawn as well. So black tried to swindle him. Plays rook c2, pretty innocuous move. Rook e1 check, king f3. And already, white is in a lot of danger. Simply rook a2. a6, not really sensing the danger. So uh, what is black's thing that he's going to play against, obviously? He's already started playing against it. What's his one idea? His idea isn't really to stop these pawns, because we're beyond stopping the pawns. Kind of need to check, yeah. it's, it's, he's playing for mate. He's, uh, in classic Hikaru style, he's trying to find some way to checkmate this king uh, before these pawns promote. And I'll just show it quickly. The king comes to f5, bringing in his final piece. There's a knight check. The king comes to e4. You can kind of see that a box is being built. The king covers these three squares. The bishop covers some key squares. And already, the king's in a box. The question is, how do we tighten this box? How do we tighten the noose? Uh, rook f3 is played, hoping for an exchange. Black does not trade. And after bishop h4, the game is already over. So you can see how quickly things can kind of go wrong. From this position, uh, white is just much, much better. And I think is, is simply winning here, with this king firmly placed in the center of the board, where it can be nice and safe. Uh, all he has to do is place something like rook c3. Black will have to move out of the way. We can come to c4 where all our pieces are, nice defenders. We've got pawns and pieces, and we'll never get checkmated. Instead, of course, king e4, simply running in the wrong direction. And once the white king's over here, I think it's just over. You need these pieces around your king. So uh, if this class was nothing else, well, first let me show the finish. So bishop h4, white actually resigned. Of course, the idea is after king g4, um, the box is kind of sealed after rook g2. The only move is rook g3, and this is checkmate. So if nothing else, uh, let this class be a cautionary tale, OK? Uh, if you find yourself in a totally winning position, um, it's very, very easy. And it's happened to countless players countless times. It's very easy to just turn your brain off and say, all right, I've won this game once. I'm not going to have to win it again. Uh, I've got everything I need to win the game. I'm just going to play natural moves and get this over with, go home, take a, take a nap, get this over with. I've, I've won this game. I don't know why he's not resigning. You can't play like that. You've got to be alert. You've got to be aware of when your opponent's going for these tricks, and you've got to be ready to stop them. Um, once again, when you're swindling, just a quick review, you need something to play for, whether it be a passed pawn, whether it be a weakness, whether it be the weak king. Very often it is. You need something to play for, and you should be willing to give up a lot to play for it, even if it doesn't look like it works. If you're just playing for nothing, and you're just w letting uh, your opponent do whatever he wants to end the game, eventually your opponent will end the game. So always find counterplay. Um, with that in mind, any questions about tonight's class? Uh, anything at all? Any, any games you wanted to look at a little bit more? Will you make this available to? Yep, yeah, it's, it's public already online. Uh, once again, let me go over this quickly, if we can pull up the, in the board, maybe. If you want to find these studies, just go to Lee Chess, go to Studies, and search RT2K. I put that on, on all the studies. You can see them all uh, right here. In this case, the one was Swindler's Paradise. And there it pops right up. And you can look at all these games yourself. Um, with that in mind, thank you all for coming out. Thank you, YouTube audience, for watching. Uh, hopefully, this was an enjoyable one. It was a little bit more on the fun side than serious chess. See you next time.